Welcome to today's episode of Row of Attention. I am joined by Robert Gibson, Nikita Zuev, and Anthony Simeon. And today we're going to do a, something a little bit different. We're going to do a character study instead of a book. A real pop culture icon, or at least he was when I was growing up. Codename 007. A British secret service agent created by Ian Fleming, who debuted in the 1953 novel Casino Royale. The name of this secret service agent is none other than... Sean Connery! No, I kid. It's James Bond. James Bond's first movie appearance is in 1962, played by Sean Connery. And interestingly, the novel from which the movie was adapted is not Casino Royale, the first book, which the adaptation of which came much later. The very first novel to be adapted was actually Dr. No, the sixth novel in the series. In the 60-some years that James Bond had been on the silver screen, the character had been portrayed by many actors, bringing their own take on the character. The smooth, charismatic, and witty Bond portrayed by Sean Connery established many of the character's iconic traits. Roger Moore had a more light-hearted, one could say campy approach uh, and emphasized the playboy persona of Bond. Timothy Dalton brought a more intense and brooding uh, interpretation of the character while Pierce Brosnan took a more balanced approach. His bond is suave, sophisticated, and capable. Casino Royale would not be adapted until Daniel Craig took on the mantle of James Bond. And it must be said that Daniel Craig's portrayal of James Bond is perhaps the closest to the source material. The literary James Bond is a much more complex character, often flawed. He is a ruthless, professional, and determined. He is a very patriotic uh, man but at the same time he, he is made cynical and world weary by his experiences in the service of said country. He is unable to form lasting relationship and in Casino Royale quite addicted to gambling. It's very interesting for me to note the difference between movie screen born and book born. And let's see what my co-hosts today have to say about the character. Over to you all. I'm opening the floor to you guys. Anyone want to start? Hmm. Just a general roll call of who, what, who did what for this character study, I think would be imprudent before we even begin. So let's start with Anthony. Anthony, what did you do in order to prepare for this podcast? I, well, I mean, I'm very much interested to see what you all have to say from the literary side i have to say that i i really didn't delve into i've tried to read some of the bond stuff over the years to varying degrees of success uh but that's more about me than the, the source material i'm i'm i was a big fan of the movies back when i was a kid and bond was a very you know kind of a power fantasy or a manly fantasy figure for me you know the guy who was everything that I wasn't as a kid, you know, handsome, suave, good with a gun, good with the ladies. You know, I wasn't any of those things. And still, still, I am not. But anyway, we'll forget about that. But, uh, but so, I mean, for me, it was the it was really a, a cinematic journey for me. So that's my source material. So I'm really coming at it from an American perspective as an American kid and now man who grew up with the Bond films. So that's. I, you know, I'm very much on the film side, not the literary side. All right. And what about you, Robert? Recently, I've been thinking of it in terms of uh, the unique aspect, almost unique. I can't think of any other example of a case of archetype creation by a single author. It's quite a remarkable achievement in that everybody knows who James Bond is. Fancy being a writer who invents somebody and everybody knows who he is. It's it's really fantastic. Uh, and also you get loads of articles in magazines, two articles in my History Today collections about 
who was the inspiration for James Bond? In other words, who was the real James Bond? For example, it's been said that uh, a certain Sidney Riley, who was a, an agent involved in an attempt to, to overthrow Lenin in 1918, was actually the inspiration for James Bond. And uh, another one says that a frogman by name Lionel Crabb, who disappeared on a on a, um, an attempt to investigate the ship which uh, Khrushchev, Khrushchev came to visit England in 1956 and whose headless body was washed up a year later in Chichester Harbour was actually the inspiration for James Bond. Uh, not a very successful inspiration, one has to say. Uh, and, um, and, and there you go, there's somebody who never existed, but who seems to be more real than lots of people who have existed. Uh, I suppose Sherlock Holmes is perhaps the, the closest equivalent I can think of. Uh, but actually, when you get to reading the books, I was impressed, but I, I was also surprised in the, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of Fleming as a writer. He does have a huge talent for creating villains, really, really good villains in his books. And Bond himself is an interesting character in that he has this self-indulgent side, but also it struggles with his Puritan side. He, he gets dissatisfied with the high life, although the high life is something he, he wants, but he also can't stand it after a while and he has to risk his life to to get out of it and um then there's this what to me is very strange love of gambling i'm really as far as you can possibly get to some to someone who likes gambling i just don't get it at all but the author manages to create interesting scenes out of this fixation with gambling, particularly in Casino Royale, obviously, and also in Goldfinger. So there's a lot to think about. And um, one more thing to mention, perhaps uh, not uh, discoverable from the movies, but certainly comes out very strongly in the books, is that Bond has a very strong taboo against killing in cold blood. He simply can't do it. Even when he's ordered to assassinate somebody, he can't do it. Uh, I might also mention that the women in the books are by no means cardboard characters. They're, they, they're distinct from one another. They're not just interchangeable dolls. So uh, lots, to, lots to talk about. I could go on and on, but let's give one of you guys a chance. Um, thank you for ignoring the premise of what I was trying to do, Robert. Uh, what about you, actually? What, what are you? Uh, what did you do to prepare for this uh, podcast? Well, um, like Anthony, I grew up uh, watching almost all the Bond films. A lot of the older ones I missed. I don't think I watched Goldfinger. Uh, but you, you know, James Bond is that very manly archetype. And for this podcast, I read. Casino Royale and watch the movie in which Daniel Craig appeared in uh, which is also his first Bond movie and it is Casino Royale uh, there was also I think there is a spoof Casino Royale movie I think uh, made in 1962 There's but two, that, yeah. that, that was a comedy and I don't think uh, I want to uh, <laughs> spend my time on that one But uh, yeah I I am actually really really Struck by how different uh, Book Born and movie Born Really is And I have to echo some of the things that Rob said Yeah And yourself Nikki uh, Well I've watched Five movies I've watched uh, From Russia with Love uh, from 1963 on Her Majesty's Secret Service from 1969, Moonraker from 1960s uh, from 1979. Sorry, The World Is Not Enough uh, from 1999, 
and Casino Royale from 2006. And I also read Ian Fleming's very first uh, novel, Casino Royale, um, which is, by the way, if it's any any indicator, uh, women are cardboards in, in those stories. I'm sorry. Um, if all the other stories have different, like, women that are that are way more interesting fair enough but vespa her her single thing that he she does um on screen that's really of any importance is that she gives bond inspiration for the name of his drink in my opinion um i well, I, I mean she a, also gives yeah. inspiration to she also inspires him on like I mean, I guess in the Craig era, she also inspires all of his actions and inaction. Yeah, yeah, we're not talking about the movie. Yeah. We're talking about the book. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah, the yeah, book. So, okay. Well, yeah, okay. Yeah, the so book, in the book, the, in the Casino movie Royale things, has nothing. Yeah, Casino Royale 2006 has nothing to do with Ian with Fleming's book, yeah. Casino Royale's uh, right. portrayal of Vespa at it all. Is so you're saying zero? In, like absolutely. You're zero. saying in the book? Yeah. It, it, well, I mean, the book was. Uh, <laughs> it's like it's really different. Like I okay, cannot, I yeah. cannot begin to emphasize how different book Bond is from movie Bond, and I'm not, and it's, it's from Sean Connery onwards all the way down to Daniel Craig. It is, Bond is so different, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll. Uh, I also did a bunch of uh, interviews with my mom and dad. My dad is the one who made the list. Uh, for the uh, for the five movies because he he really loves this franchise and uh, I would like to um, give you a short summary of each each movie now and also some commentaries from my father and mother which I found most amusing. Uh, so from Russia with Love uh, stars Sean Connery. It's the very first movie of the Bondiana that I watched. That's what it's by the way. That's what the series of films is called in, in Russian. I don't know if it's the same in English, but they call them the Bondiana. I don't know why. Don't ask me. Um, so, Is Rasiya Slubovio, from Russia with Love, I think it's appropriate to say it in Russian as well, uh, is, a, is a really hard, um, uh, what's it called, like trying to be as realistic as possible story of a spy for 1963. There's ridiculous stuff that happens in the movie. Like the opening sequence is uh, like the anti-Bond looking for Bond and then he kills Bond, but it turns out to be like a guy in a perfect rubber mask of Bond. And it was all like a, a training exercise for him. And I'm just thinking like, did the other guy he was hunting really need that mask? Like, to really be Bond in this exercise? Like, I get it, it's a movie, and it was for suspense. But just thinking about it, like, from the real-world perspective inside their heads, they were all thinking of this exercise. Like, he has to wear the mask. He has to wear the mask, otherwise this doesn't work. Um, well, I'll tell, you it, one, I'll tell you one other yeah. thing in which it worked, and that is, it spawned Mission Impossible. <laughs> That's true. Got That's true. To there's be, a lot of... Got, got to be yeah, the, uh, the inspiration for Mission Impossible. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the Mission Impossible running <laughs> joke with the masks. Yeah. With the hyper-realistic masks. Yeah. It's, it, that's the part. I, I love that part. That, and I knew, yeah, they totally got that from Bond. So, and that's it's so, just a great so the, for the movie. So, the movie is about Bond uh, fighting against Spectre without him knowing he's fighting against Spectre. They're all... You know, like they're all behind the scenes and are pulling the strings, and really he's fighting the uh, the Russian and Bulgarian secret services throughout the movie. But really, it's uh, you know um, this criminal organization um, that is behind all this, and he's you know he, th there's this coding device that he's trying to get uh, away from the Russians and then to the to the UK, and um, man, Sean Connery is a great actor. He's a great actor. Uh, it's a movie of its time. It's it's really old-fashioned and it's very misogynistic. So, you know, if you're going to watch it and you're a person who gets offended by that stuff, get ready. Like, open up your Twitter like on several tabs because you're going to be tweeting like every 20 seconds about something in this movie. I'm telling you. You're going to be so pissed off. You have no idea. Um, yeah. Um... But that is the most realistic part of, well, not most realistic, but most prevalent part of James Bond from Casino Royale in Ian Fleming's version 
that also survives in this movie because everything else is very different. You know, he's just as misogynistic as he is in uh, in that book where he's like, man, what is this Wesper woman doing on my fucking mission? I just, you know, like this is a man's world and so on and so forth. Like that, that's very much Sean Connery in, in, the, in that movie uh, from Russia with Love. Um, and um, the movie has the coolest bad guy uh, out of all of the five movies that I watched. It's basically Anti-Bond, as I, Anti-Bond, as I called him. Um, and he play, he's played by the guy who looks very similar to Daniel Craig, actually. Uh, Google it sometime. He even appears shortless, just like Daniel Craig in, in his first movie. It's kind of crazy. Uh, he's also blonde. You know, he kind of looks like he has, he's, got, um, he's got that physique. And the, the, the sequence where they battle each other on the train going to Bulgaria, amazing. Stunning, stunning, uh, stunning stuff. But it is a movie of its time. You can clearly see uh, the, the strings bef- behind the, the stage, so to speak. Um, my mother's comments. Yes, this is Bond. This is Sean Connery. That's what it's all about. That's the original. Uh, amazing. Beautiful scenery. Um, fine architecture. Istanbul looks so beautiful. Way more beautiful <laughs> in the film than it really is. Um, my, my father's comments. Um, Sean Connery is badass from one side. From another side, he also kind of looks like he really needs to sit down. <laughs> every, every act, after every action scene, uh, he, he seems to be really struggling. It did not look like that in Dr. No, I promise you, Nikita. That's him like, talking to me directly behind the camera. Um, but, uh, it, you know, like, this is one of my most enjoy- uh, favorite movies about Bond. Uh, do you guys want me to continue on to the second movie, or do you guys want to discuss something and then we can come back to me? Uh, well, you are very entertaining, uh, so we'll let you continue on for a couple more beats. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service, 1967, uh, George Lazenby plays this guy, and backstory to the way this guy became Bond is crazy. So he was a model for like underwear he was an australian model and his friend was going to audition james bond and the guy snuck in this this model during during this whole uh, shtick while his friend was unawares he went past the secretary uh, and went directly to the guy who was doing the casting and he was like he was standing there in the foyer like leaning against the door, showing his watch, and he said something along the lines of, like, you know, I heard you're uh, looking for a new James Bond. You know, he was the uh, first guy after Sean Connery, um, and he lied his way to become uh, the next James Bond because he had zero acting uh, practice before that, zero acting skills. It shows in the movie somewhat, but he's also an amazing Bond. I think out of all of the... um, five movies that I watched that was that one was the most like popcorn enjoyable like it was just really smooth ride and was interesting to see what was going on the plot is uh, the Spectre are at it again bad boys Um, and James Bond found a a new woman like this this Italian countess that he's really in love with um, and uh, who's who's um, father kind of makes him uh, marry her. He's like, he, she needs a man like you, bud. She's too unruly. <laughs> so cringe shit like that. And um, um, they, they, they sort of have a romance. Um, and, it's, and it's interesting to see them interact because they really have chemistry, those two actors. Um, Bond is very suave, but not as I suave think, as Sean Connery. I think yeah. uh, they actually I'm married so in real life. They oh, actually really? married. Okay, I didn't know that. Tracy the Vin, I can't remember her last name, but mm-hmm. I think the two of them married. That's yeah, crazy. For a few I hope it didn't end up like the end of the movie because she dies after the wedding. Um, yeah. But yeah, so so there's a whole sequence where uh, James Bond goes to Switzerland, and uh, Blofeld has this cool laboratory in the Alps, and he uses the. The power of suggestion in order to cure pe- uh, cure people's illnesses, uh, specifically like um, what's it called allergies. Like one one woman has allergies uh, when she she eats uh, poultry, when she eats chicken, 
And there's this whole sequence after having sex with James Bond, these fucking <laughs> speakers turn on and they're like, you all were always afraid of chickens. They tasted really bad to you, but no more. And it's all like very serious Blofeld dialogue. It's just hilarious. Awful. Anyway, um, it all ends with uh, Bond uh, infiltrating this place as, uh, you know, as some sort of a professor who is quote unquote trying to prove um, Blofeld's royal status um and it ends in a in a bunch of um what do they call them uh in a bunch of action scenes the, the movie is kind of devoid of action scenes uh there are a couple at the beginning and then it just kind of slows down and then at the end it's all just action scenes on action scenes on action scenes and it ends with a with damn helicopters coming down towards the alps and bombing the shit out of that whole base it's crazy it's it's a crazy ending. Uh, my mother's notes. Who is this ugly man? Please give me back Sean Connery. Um, it, it was very sweet that they married, but I saw it from a while away. That woman was going to die. Um, what else did she say? That was interesting. Um, I remember the lab and I was thinking at the beginning of the, uh, at the beginning of that scene that it, this seems like a great way to, um, to get rid of your allergies. Right up until the man started shouting from the speakers about chicken. Then I thought it was all malarkey. Um, my father said that this is one of the most uncanny of uh, bonds that he's ever seen, but it strangely fits. He really enjoyed the scenes with skis and little background from him. He uh, and his family were located in Eastern Germany at the time, somewhere in 1978, 79. And his TV set, was able to pick up the international German channels that weren't Soviet channels. And he um, he saw the next movie on uh, on the list, and it was the first movie that he ever saw um, uh, when it comes to the Bond, uh, you know, uh, movies, Moonraker. Now imagine this. You are a, like, 10, 12-year-old kid who... The biggest thing that you've ever seen on TV was a ballet dance, right? In black and white. And then suddenly you're in East Germany, like the TV is in color. It picks up the international satellite and you see uh, a scene where, uh, first of all, a bunch of guys steal a shuttle. And then you see this uh, British spy on a plane who fights a bunch of dudes, falls out of a plane. And then a guy with metal teeth tries to kill him. And then, you know, like this agent, James Bond, hits him in the face. And the dude falls into a circus and somehow survives. Right? For my father, it was like a, like it was an explosion of the head. And for me, although I've seen a lot of stuff on TV, Moonraker is the craziest movie of all time. I don't know what the people were on when they made it, but it's actually insane. It is the most insane amount of stuff on screen. And it came out two years after um, Star Wars. Uh, and it's, it's very visible, especially the ending scene. I'm not going to spoil it right now, but the ending is crazy. So uh, James Bond um, learns that the British government bought a shuttle. The Britain, like the, the British Isles never had a space program. So why the hell they needed a shuttle? I have no idea, but they did. Anyway, that shuttle got stolen. Okay, sec second revelation. And he needs to go to Florida to speak to the guy who made the shuttle. That doesn't make any sense unless you're already sure that the guy who made the shuttle is the guy who stole it. But whatever, we're going to ignore that. Spoilers, the guy who made the shuttle <laughs> stole it. <laughs> um, he's, he's some magnanimous, really rich guy. And he... Um, uh, what's it called? He bought the Eiffel Tower, but he can't extract it yet from France or something because the government doesn't allow him to fly it over to Florida. But it belongs to him. Like that's one of the little things we learn about him. So this is the you know the level of how great this movie is. Uh, anyway, uh, James Bond meets a bunch of hot chicks. Stuff happens. Oh my God! The guy who built the shuttle stole it. Reveal. Um, he is definitely a bad guy. Um, James Bond goes to Venice, and the cra the first crazy scene of the movie really begins. I thought it was the you know falling out of the plane and fighting a guy with metal teeth. No, 
James Bond has a uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, a chase scene through the rivers of Venice on a I don't know how you pronounce it gondola, gondola, whatever. You gondola. know those gondola. Okay. Uh, he's he's racing on that against some bad guys, and then in the middle of the race, he's like, you know what? Uh, you know, I don't want to be on on water anymore. And he pushes a bunch of buttons, and the gondola becomes uh, half a car, and he gets out of the uh, like out of the water and starts driving in the middle of Venice, and everyone is like, whoa, what the hell is going on here? There's literally a scene where they show a pigeon doing a double take. I'm not kidding. Like if you if you want to watch this and and have your mind explode, find that scene. There is a pigeon who goes like this. Like it's what is happening in this movie? But that's not it. You know, it it keeps getting crazier. So one of the hot chicks that um, double also. And by the way, the only reason I'm calling them all this is because this is as much. Um, how do I say this? This is as much a personality that the the movies give these people. So, you know, I'm just not elaborating. It's, it's, her name is Dr. Goodhead. Goodhead. Do you, un- do you understand what's happening in this movie? Double entendre, just, just, just for fun, just for lols. Yeah, her name is Dr. Goodhead. Isn't that funny? The kids won't get it. Um, this is a kid's movie, by the way. Uh, except for one scene where there's a woman who is chased into the woods and is murdered by a bunch of dogs. And that comes out of nowhere. It's so violent. And you're just like, whoa, what happened here? You know, did a different director uh, decide to film this part? Anyway, so uh, Dr. Goodhead turns out to be Agent Goodhead. And she teams up with Bond. And they go around to Rio de Janeiro and find a bunch of stuff that really doesn't matter. The bad guy wants to rule the world. And he will do that by killing everyone and creating a master race. All right. That's all you really need to know about the plot. But the guy with the chief shows back up. And he starts attacking Bond and his uh, love of the love of his life now. Dr. Goodhead. Agent Goodhead. Uh, whatever you want to call it. And there's a sequence where they, where they fight. And, you know, like this tower falls apart. And you think, ah, the guy with the metal chief, he's dead. Jaws, I think they call him. And, and then he's saved by a girl that's like 1.5 meters tall. She's blonde. And, and I kid you not, the movie plays the most obvious romantic music with like, with like violins and like trumpets there. She helps him and he like looks at her. She's like, oh, you look okay. And he smiles with, a, with his crazy metal teeth. And she looks at him and she smiles at him too. And it's like, okay, I guess, I guess, the, I guess the henchman of the bad guy is... You know, found love. Whoa, how crazy. It's like, what is this about? Anyway, somehow, James, because we're spending way too much time on this movie, uh, James Bond uh, ends up at a space station, which, by the way, the reveal of the space station, the shot, amazing, amazing, uh, amazing cinematography. Uh, all of these movie, uh, movies have really great cinematography. Uh, James Bond ends up on the space station from which the bad guy wants to destroy the world. And Jaws decides to join him. He's like, you know what, Bond, this guy, he wants to create a master race. Look at my face. I'm not part of the master race. He's going to kill me too. Let's, let's join up. Let's, let's do this. And while this is happening, um, this, you know, a bunch of British and CIA agents uh, fight the army of the bad guy in space, in astronaut suits, shooting lasers at each other. It's crazy. It's so crazy. I, I don't think I could describe my awe. Um, the uh, Bond escapes. Um, everything is kind of coming to a close. The space station explodes. But then there's like a throwaway line at NASA that like, oh, uh, you know, two, there are two survivals, a tall guy with metal teeth and a blonde girl. And you're like, oh, well, at least the henchman and the blonde girl get to live happily ever after. Like, oh, whatever. And then the, the movie ends with uh, NASA and a bunch of uh, secret agents calling James Bond on his shuttle, and they catch him in the middle of the act of having sex with Dr. Goodhead. Moonraker. Yeah, Moonraker for me was, <laughs> yeah, that was sort of my en- entree into the Roger Moore era. And, you know, that was when Roger Moore was still kind of, it was campy, but he, I still kind of admired him. He wasn't, he wasn't Sean Connery. But, you know, 
he he gave a little bit of camp to that, and I really appreciate it. I mean, and Jaws was my one of my favorite villains from the whole series of movies, just because he was so weird and strange and gigantic. And yeah, the romance subplot with the girl always cracked me up. But yeah, I mean, it was that was after that. Like, I couldn't stand the Roger Moore interpretation of the character. Really, as time went on, he was just getting way too old, and it was like okay. You know, you're compared to Sean Connery's interpretation of the character, which was just pure like masculinity personified, you know, could really had no flaws in the character. I mean, Roger Moore made the character interpretation of the character was more a little more campy, but realistic in a way. Like, you know, he was he didn't seem quite like Superman, like perfect. Whereas Sean Connery's interpretation was he was like infallible, it seemed. I could always get out of a situation. Whereas, you know, even though in the end, Roger Moore's bond always did get out of everything and wrapped up things neatly pretty much in the end. It was, you know, he was Moonraker that has a special place in my heart from the that era, the Roger Moore era. Um, but after that, it was like, for me, decline. <laughs> I don't know how anyone else feels, but... Um, but I mean, yeah, I think it, it's, I a, it. it's a very good... Uh... Is it's it's like it's like a very good uh, comparison. Like it's uh, it's such a such a departure from the actual source material. Like his it, Moonraker's Bond is such a great example of the departure from the book material because the the Bond in the books are so much more. Um, They are, they are not as uh, they are not larger than life that the that the movie bonds tend to be even Daniel Craig's uh, portrayal is is still very is still bigger than life compared to book bond and I'm speaking um, about Casino Royale here because as um, as Rob had pointed out there is an awful lot of description of gambling in Casino Royale and from the sounds of it it sounds like the rest of the books also have a lot of description of gambling am I right Rob well certainly Goldfinger has two parts to do with that spirit of things the very gripping golfing scene between Bond and Goldfinger and earlier the scene where uh, Bond is hired by an American called DuPont to find out how Goldfinger manages to cheat at cards. And uh, he... Oh, and I just remembered something else. In Moonraker, Hugo Drax, the villain, also cheats at cards. And Bond uh, finds him out. And there's a great line where... Drax says, spend, uh, Bond's got the money off him, He's, and Drax says, spend it quickly, Mr. Bond. In other words, uh, I'm going to blow up London, and then you won't have the chance. So, you know, enjoy the money while you can. Anyway, yeah, quite a bit of gambling. I would say the other books don't have as much of it as in Casino Royale. Yeah, like, I think, like, mm, like the book itself, like, my only, I, I, I guess my like my real criticism of Casino Royale would be like there is a lot of description on gambling, and it might be fascinating to somebody who's really into poker and all that stuff. But you know, to me, it was just like um, a little bit too much of the gambling thing, mm. and and I really have to say again. So one of the things that uh, Rob also pointed out is that book born is not violent he's uh, i mean he gets into a bit of a scruffle but uh from time to time but most of the time he's not particularly uh athletic like you see in the in the bond movies he and i think this is so interesting right because in casino royale like right in the beginning uh you had that black and white um section where he confronted where Bond confronted like this uh this corrupt guy that was selling out British uh secret service 
uh, intelligence to make a quick buck for himself. And that bad guy was like, I've not heard of anyone being promoted to double O and and the, the the way you get promoted to double O is you must kill at least two people. And that is also in Casino Royale. And it's like that it that is that is that is an indicator of just how much deaths born cost in the book, which is close to none. That you get promoted to double O, which is supposed to be this uh, very prestigious uh, rank as a Secret Service agent. That what you have to do is kill two guys, and you think back to how many people. <laughs> Bond has killed not just not just in the in the biography of the movies the entire biography of the movies but within Casino Royale itself he killed he killed this <laughs> he killed this guy right off the bat running into the um that re- that that he had a chase scene in that re- he ran into I can't remember what embassy was and Bond Bond in that movie was uh, was particularly gruesome. He killed the guy. He killed the uh, the guy that uh, gambled with him his uh, car. I think his name is Dimitrio or something like that. And a whole yeah, bunch. He steals of, his girl. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, steals his. And well, I mean that was before he stabbed the guy. <laughs> it was like. Oh. So well, I mean that's kind of arguably worse. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I mean, uh, the the amount of violence that movie Bond has it, compared to the book Bond is like, whoa, it's really mind boggling, and it's like, book Bond is not nearly as physically capable as movie Bond. He was uh, in Casino Royale. He was. Um, uh, he was nearly killed. He that in Casino Royale you had the same torture scene, uh, uh, where he was tortured by uh, what's how do you say his name? Le Le Chiffre. Le Chiffre. Le Chiffre. It's uh, Le supposed Chiffre. to be French for the numbers or something like that, uh, if I remember right. And that's the other thing about the Bond book. Actually, there's so much. French thrown into the book. I'm. I was like, is this some way where Ian Fleming is trying to seem smarter than he is, or something like that? It's like, uh, am I supposed to be impressed by all this French? <laughs> I was like, uh, okay. Uh, but yeah, I think the biggest thing that stood out to me was two things. One, how non-violent book Bond is and two how much introspection Bond actually has in the books Mm. like I was there was one section at the end of the book where he was um, um, Mathis is such a different character in the book versus the 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 movie by the way Um, where he was Bond was uh, recovering from the injuries he suffered from the torture scene by Le Chiffre and he was at Bond was re- talking about some really really um, interesting political stuff like he was really questioning why he's doing this like he he wanted to retire from spying and he just like every time um, he doesn't know why he's killing the dudes he's killing he doesn't know why uh, what good it does and and that's and he he <laughs> he's talking about some really interesting stuff like like the Tories of his days would have been uh crazy radicals of yesteryear kind of kind of stuff like that and I thought wow I mean that is a surprising amount of depth from uh from a character that seems to be about as unconnected to his emotional self as was presented like the way book the book born started off is he's just like really disconnected to what he's feeling 
Like he's just about he's just put his focus on the job, doesn't really think much. But then you get stuff like that, which is like, well, the guy clearly thinks. Then there's a lot more depth to him. He's not shallow at all. And yeah, and and I think like the 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 relationship he had with Vesper in the book is again very different from the movie. To be quite honest, yeah, I think it's such a it's such a. It's such a. It's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> I mean, towards the end, he actually seems to uh, exhibit some sort of feeling for the for Vesper, and I don't, I don't know if I should spoil spoil the ending, but he was very upset at her revelation towards the end, to the point where he's just like, "Ah, oh, the bitch is dead," you know. It's like oh my god! It's like it's like I, I can't uh, I can't make out. So, I think if I have to just summarize my rambling <laughs> thoughts, is I find it very difficult to pigeonhole book bond. Book bond is very is a much more interesting, uh, multifaceted character than movie bond. And movie bond, I think, is crafted in that particular way to. Uh, you know, I've noticed like the way Bond is portrayed in the movies tend to sort of match the the era, the predom- the prevailing uh, mood of that particular era. Like the uh, Roger Moore, the Roger Moore Bond is. Like really kind of fits the 1980s campy feel of most movies out there and then you know like 1990s roll around and then things everybody wants to be grim dark and so Timothy Dalton had a more grim dark uh, brooding uh, anti-hero kind of feel to him and then, uh, Pierce Brosnan brought a more you know more balanced the role, which is kind of how the year, the 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 two thousands felt to me, and Daniel Craig uh, brought it back to that almost thuggish uh, Bond, which again felt like it was it was rolling to another different era of uh, movie personas, or so it seems to me. So it well, it to seems to me it, it it seems like uh, the um, Bond franchise chases whatever is popular at the time in a lot of aspects because uh, um, you know Born Identity came out uh, right like almost right before Casino Royale and you can see the influence there you know in the fights and the way everything is shot um, not not to the detriment uh, in any way shape or form uh, you know like the movie is, is uh, good for it. You know, it's it's um, if if you're gonna take influence from anything, Born Identity is a is a great place to to look. Yeah, but Daniel Craig was like more struggling with his emotions and struggling with, you know, making mistakes and errors. So he was definitely more. It seemed he more more human, versus, you know, Sean Connery was, sort of on the game on the ball the whole time, and you know, so Roger Moore was. You know, it seemed like he kind of didn't really, you know, maybe he was seemed a little more campy and humorous, but he still wrapped it up in the end. I mean, I know that all the Bond movies to a point, but it wasn't until the Daniel Craig era that I, he, they really kind of let him, to me, seem more human. You know, even, I mean, the the mm-hmm. one, oh, you know, gosh, I'm drawing a blank now. The one movie with Pierce Brosnan where he got into a sword fight that was very gosh which one was it was amazing but i forget which one of brosnan's movies it was but you know he definitely seemed like he was out of shape and they were getting well he was he was in shape but they were fighting so long and getting so tired they were smashing things and grabbing different swords and different cases i forget specifically which one um but it was i don't know so it was just by the time you got to craig there definitely was an effort like you said to make it more like you know a hero with human problems, you know, like a born identity sort of thing, but you know, not to that extreme. But yeah, I mean, I I like the Craig era. I like 
the movie Casino Royale, but it was after a time. It was just his the overarching quest. I felt like I kind of, kind of got in the way or his overarching problems with the death of Vesper and, you know, going through those movies, sort of coloring things. You know, it kind of was like I was feeling like I wanted to go back to the earlier, more superhuman seeming Bond, but it's like I can also see the other side of things. In terms I mean, of making him more human and approachable, and maybe that cleaves closer to the books from what you're all describing. You know, I mean the the book, or at least Casino Royale, the uh, plots are a lot more. They're not as grand as, uh, as as the Bond movies. Like, like, like the plot in Casino Royale. At least I don't know about the rest of the books, and maybe Rob can help fill us in on some of the other books mm. because he's read the whole series but but the plot in Casino Royale is very mundane compared to even the movie uh, Casino Royale because in the in the movie Casino Royale you had you have this guy trying to le chiffre I'm butchering the word uh, I, I think I think I'll just call him the numbers the numbers guy is trying <laughs> The numbers. The numbers. the numbers. the numbers guy. Yeah, the numbers right. guy <laughs> is trying to is trying to manipulate the stock market and all that stuff. Whereas the the numbers, the book version of the numbers guy is so mundane. He's like <laughs> compared to to the movie version. The book version was just uh, was just a guy that uh, overstepped his bounds and and started spending money where he shouldn't have. He was setting up brothels. Uh, bordellos and overstretch himself and that's why he's now desperately trying to gamble the money back uh, and it was like it's like it's like watching the movie and reading the book is like ooh this is so different <laughs> like they really breathed in a lot of oxygen to the movies well I mean there is one thing to be said and um, which is that the the Daniel Craig's version of Casino Royale was uh, updated, I would say, from the book because the book is talking about a era in the past. Is talk this is like Cold War period, and the the real bad the real bad asses I have to say is the is the what's the acronym the Smirk Smirch 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 it comes from the word um, Schmerz, uh, Smirch, Smirch Yes, mm. the real badass is, is that death guy. To spies. Yeah, death yeah. to spies. The real badass in the book is not Bond or, or the numbers. It's that guy. It's uh, <laughs> the guy that came in in the end and offed uh, the numbers. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and and yet, and, and yet uh, the bad guy actually saves Bond's life, doesn't he? Yeah. He uh, he kills uh, the Le Chiffre, so um, yeah, he killed Le Chiffre and his uh, two henchmen, and I I I don't know. I gotta say, like the the Russian spy guy, the Soviet Union spy guy. I cannot pronounce it. I'm sorry, <laughs> Ricky. <Russian> spy guy. <laughs> Smirsh. Smirsh. It's okay. Every every time you're about to say the name, just just pause and I'll say it for you. Okay. The <laughs> guy is so much cooler in the book than in the movie the movie was just like this guy with his hands outstretched and pointing a gun at at, at at the numbers I was like oh my god like there's so much more mystique uh uh in, in, in he the the Nikki, help me out Smirch. here. Smirch, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I was, I, I was not focused on all of this. Whatever. The Soviet Union guy, he, had, he was so much cooler in the book, had so much more mystique than, than, than in, 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 in the movie. Like, I mean, like, the few is just so I mean, different. It, in, the, in the movie, it's not even Smirch. It's, uh, it's uh, the precursor to Spectre, basically. Oh. Right, because because at first mm. at first it's like secret organization in the first movie, and then in the Quantum of Solace they're like it's quantum, 
and then uh, in Skyfall they just ignore all that really. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I think there's a bit of stuff about the spect- Spectre, but not that much. And then in the movie that's called The Spectre, they're like, Quantum of Solace was really about Spectre, and so was Casino Royale. Le Chiffre was working for them the whole time. Oh, but that's not really? that's not a thing in the yeah that's not the thing in uh, Casino Royale uh, the book. So I gotta ask I gotta ask uh, <clears throat> I gotta ask Rob. Does a smash smash uh, help me out here, Nikki? Smash, smash. Did oh the smash? <laughs> did the smash make it into the into the the other by bi- uh, other books? Yes, I think the first smash book is uh, Thunderball. I believe. You mean the first um, Spectre book? No, sorry, that's Spectre. Sorry, forget what I said. Smash is in from Russia with love. Hmm. And and this and the first book. I I need to I, say something. I think about uh, you mentioned uh, XJ. You mentioned I think at one point the plots. Uh, I have to say I don't think that Ian Fleming is all that brilliant at plots. I I read the books for the textures and the the physical descriptions and the characters. Um, it, they are exciting books, but they're not really that well constructed. And one of the most uh, telling examples of that is the fact that the beginnings are usually much better than the ends. I think that Fleming is great at setting a, a opening scenes of novels and uh, building up the expectation but at the end it, it gets a bit confused more often than not the ending to casino royale was very abrupt i felt mm. was like okay the bitch dead fucker you know and that is literally where the book ends i'm like huh what the hell <laughs> it's so <laughs> weird dude. So, and I'm it was sorry. so was so abrupt i was like mm. okay uh all right i guess i guess uh i guess that's just the book <laughs> mm. overall uh and there are some there are actually some um writing things that the book i felt was like it i don't know if it's present in the rest of the titles but in casino royale at least ian fleming has a habit of breaking the fourth wall uh by using the word you like addressing the reader like he when he was describing uh the casino he he would slip into he would slip into you know the 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 railings come up to your waist or something like that i i i quite uh, it struck me quite a bit because like that was completely like it, that took me out of the story immediately it was like being addressed in that direct manner and and uh, he, uh, I, I just don't feel like uh, he's not. Ian Fleming isn't a gripping writer to me, at, at least. Uh, I mean, when the books were are uh, exciting, which like the Bentley, the chase, the 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 highway chase, and then um, some of the. Like he actually manages to make the the gambling scene quite tense, even to a guy that understands almost nothing about gambling. Mm-hmm. So I I would I would say that that, that there is some he he's very good at pacing and creating atmosphere, like you said, Rob. But there are mm-hmm. some things that he's just not that great at. Uh, uh, mm. I, to me, to me, the biggest problem with Casino Royale, though, the book, was that there's just way too much technical details on gambling. Like, I don't need to know any of this, and I'm not interested mm. either. <laughs> mm. But mm. here's the thing, right? If you could take a topic like plumbing and make it exciting, wow, that's one hell of a skill. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, something I'd like to say about the the last of his books, uh, uh, the man with the golden gun. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the absolute key example of how he's brilliant at beginning a book. 
in in the first chapters bond has been brainwashed he was captured on his way back from japan in the last book in the previous book and he's been brainwashed and he's he's on a mission to kill his boss m and it's it's gripping stuff in the end he the the, the author shows how bond is defeated in his attempt because the author gives all the all the trip wires as it were that he activates on his way back um metaphorically speaking and uh then the scene where he confronts m and tells him he's a warmonger and so on he's going to kill him and uh, a screen comes down and agents throw themselves on bond and the attempt fails absolutely riveting writing and to redeem himself he goes off on this mission to deal with the villain called scaramanga who's relatively small time villain compared to blofeld but anyway he's enough of a nuisance to attract the attention of the secret service and uh to cut a long story short bond in the end defeats scaramanga and here comes a another interesting aspect of bond's character in that in the end he says to his american friend felix leiter he says scaramanga was quite a guy he should have been taken alive and uh leiter upbraids bond's naivety um he says uh once you've beaten them you make heroes out of them in other words you stupid brits uh in my book an enemy is an enemy and uh and he says, uh, it's what you were put in the world for, pest control. Uh, the pests will always be there. Don't let it worry your tiny mind. Uh, in other words, stop, uh, stop regretting these bad guys you've killed and, and be glad you're there to kill them. I, that's another example of what XJ was saying, the hidden depths in the, in the book. Um, so Bond has some respect for his some of his opponents and i also like actually like um his reaction to vespalin's death was in the book is i mean his reaction was uh, like the way the book ended was really abrupt but the way he reacted to the death actually speaks volumes to to his uh, character actually i feel mm. Uh, but Nikki, you you read Casino Royale as well, so tell us what you think about the movie and the uh, book. I think the best part of the movie and the um, what's it called um, and the book are this, exactly the same in both versions. That's the torture scene. Um, that's also echoed by both of my parents. They thought that that was the most impactful scene of the of the movie, and it it kind of gave gravitas to the entire situation. But I think. There's something very interesting that my father said about the main villain uh, of Casino Royale. He basically said, like, look, um, you know, every other movie that I suggested to you from Russia with Love and Her Majesty's Secret Service, Moonraker, The World is Not Enough, all of the um, villains there are either larger than life or part of something uh, greater that, that props them up. And it's really important what they're a part of, their organization, so on and so forth. And Le Chiffre is literally the middle guy. He's like a nobody. He's a dude who made a bad decision and pays for that, that bad decision the entirety of the movie. Um, and still somehow the movie makers made him the coolest and most intimidating uh, villain out of all... Um, sorry, I'm, I'm translating this as I'm reading this. My bad. Um, out of all of the movies. Uh, because he was f uh, a physical threat without ever being uh, physically imposing himself. And the torture scene proves that. Um, my mother said, uh, Daniel Craig uh, looks like uh, an actual spy, which is, he doesn't look like much. <laughs> but yeah, even... Uh, but, uh, what's it called? even Yeah, unassuming. But even, even, uh, even to that, uh, you know, he has the charisma. And the moment in, in the movie where he was tortured, 
I I kind of couldn't watch it. I watched it through my fingers. Um, felt really bad for the guy. Uh, and the I, fact that he was shot. Yes. I was just gonna say like the that very menacing uh, villain feel. I think that is all Matt Mickelson. Mm, mm, I'm gonna have to say, because the book's description of Le Chiffre, the numbers, is very again very different from, from. Uh, yeah, he's like a fat, so pale dude, right? Yeah, his he was described rather a bit like a slug. He, he, that was my overall feeling of the description of uh, Le Chiffre in the in the book. I thought uh, I, yeah, I, I was he, never impressed yeah. with the Bond villains. Yeah, I was never impressed with the Bond villains in the movies. I mean, but the the notable exceptions were, yeah, Mads Mikkelsen, but you have to go all the way back to Man with the Golden Gun because that was Christopher Lee. Speaking of someone who, you know, Christopher Lee has such gravitas throughout his entire acting career that him playing, you know, Scaramanga in Man with the Golden Gun was like, you know, I loved it, like his portrayal. And then it, it took me, and then every other villain, like I forgot about him. You know, Blofeld, you just remember because his name's funny. And then it's like, you know, but then you get to Mads Mikkelsen's portrayal of Le Chief, And it was like, you know, oh, oh my gosh, like an actual villain that I'm going to remember as not, you know, I know Jonathan Price, you know, was a villain. And I remember him just because he's Jonathan Price, I think, in like the world is not enough. But between everyone else, I kind of forgot, like they're kind of forgettable villains. Um to me as far as but maybe that's just a function of the actors not being you know portraying it with enough gravitas but I mean, anyway well like i i really have to say like in casino royale it absolutely is matt mickelson yeah like he he is what makes he is the one that brought that feel of a really menacing villain yeah, yeah. And the torture scene was, uh, it was, uh, it, it definitely is more graphic in the movie, not just in the sense that, you know, you're actually watching the torture scene, but in the book itself, it's a lot of the torture was implied, if I remember right. Mm. Yeah. But uh, I interrupted you, Nikki, please. Go on. Yeah, in, in effect, uh, I, I enjoyed the book for what it was, and I really enjoyed all of the movies that I watched. Um, the book has a very suave feel. You can tell that Ian Fleming uh, is either really good at faking or really knows what he's talking about whenever anything happens on screen. Uh, the, uh, the game that they play, the, the cards game, I think it's Baccara. Or I'm, I'm not sure how you say it um it's it's exciting to watch even though you're just reading it uh you know um which i think is hard to pull off in any media especially a book but yeah it was fun it was easy to follow it was uh interesting um i did uh wince a couple of times uh when i when i was reading casino royale but it wasn't because of the uh outdated uh stuff uh that i think a, a lot of people just couldn't stomach these days reading it for the first time um it was more to to do with uh just what i expected from james bond right i was uh, raised on the movies so going back to the um what's it called to the to original source material i i wish i read it before i watched the movies because i have such a clear picture of what james bond should be like and it, it is an amalgamation of all the people who've played James Bond and all the movies. Like, it's hard to say, like, okay, this is the definitive Bond or something. They all have these little pieces, like the suave of um, Sean Connery, the absolute ruthlessness of Daniel Craig's portrayal, uh, the, the campy and uh, nonchalant feel of Roger Moore, Pierce Brosnan, a straight man in a, in a comedy. Uh, you know, all, all of them have these pieces that, that are Bond-esque and it, it's it's really hard to picture any of them except for maybe a little bit of Sean Connery uh, in that original character. Yeah. Yeah, it's 
the the books definitely feel more I don't know if this is quite the appropriate words to use to describe but more down to earth than than the movies for sure. Mm. Yeah. 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 Strong uh, yeah, the Strong translation to film. Yeah. yeah, the translation of the film is definitely amped up the action. I guess that's just the media. The medium is the message, right? <laughs> it's like more realism. I so think speak, like I think like person. I think like if if you were to pull any guy off the street today and ask him what he thinks about Bond, it's probably the movie Bonds that come to mind. You know? Not 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 the book born. I, I, I don't even know who I don't even know how well did the books do actually in terms of sales. Do you know Rob? Well I think the the movies helped the books during the last two years of the author's life. Uh, he only had two years to live when uh, Doctor No came onto the the screen. But he was fairly successful. But what made him into a, a superstar obviously was the the screen that's what that's what life is like it's a pity he died at the age 56 uh, through too much smoking or whatever it was because uh, we would have it would have been good to have have some more of the books fair enough yeah yeah i think like the the movies the movies are what i think Firmly established Bond as a pop culture icon. That is mm. my take. Mm. Because I can't because see to spring from something. So uh, I can, because I can't see I can't see the book version of Bond becoming a pop culture icon like without the movies. Like mm. I, this is not. I'm not knocking the. Uh, I'm not knocking the books. Because they are they're kind of enjoyable in his own right, tortured adverts, adverbs uh, aside. Uh, but I I just don't see that version of Bond becoming like a household name where everyone will know who he is and have an idea of uh, the like a vague idea of the character or have at least seen some some stuff about. Uh, born with the very iconic opening that happens in every movie, right? The the shooting into the barrel thing. Yeah, actually, that's yeah. A, that's another thing my dad said. Uh, he said uh, I was not sold on Casino Royale. And by the way, another little bit of trivia: Casino Royale is the first uh, Bond film I saw in theaters. Um. Uh, so he said, I wasn't entirely sold on the on the reboot, uh, but then the first scene happened all in black and white, and then Daniel, uh, you know, and then I was kind of annoyed that they didn't do the the shooting thing <laughs> he called it at the beginning, but they saved it for the best part as James Bond becomes 007, and it was perfect, and so is the sequence. I love that song. I think. I think. Um, oh God, what is. That plays in Casino Royale. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I can't, I can't uh, remember. The theme it's song? Amazing. Yeah, it's like da, the theme song. Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, that's my favorite. That was my going to be a question for you all. What's your favorite Bond theme song? I think mine definitely is. Uh, yeah, you know my name, but that was Chris you know Cornell. my name. That's right. You, you know, know my, my name. name. Yeah, yeah, awesome. yeah so, and it was great. Yeah, Chris Cornell's. That was probably my best, my favorite Bond song. Uh, a View to a Kill with Duran Duran is probably a second, a close second. But I don't know. What, what about the rest of you? A uh, favorite Bond song, theme song? I tend not to notice. Uh, I tend not to notice movie soundtracks. Unfortunately, when I watch a movie. Well, if I'm noticing, yeah, if I'm like, noticing the soundtrack, that's usually a bad sign for the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just talking theme song. Just talking theme song. I don't know, uh, Nikki. I don't know. Theme song. Um, I I have okay. I have two. That's all. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. It's not. It's not that song. Um, so I think um, her uh, on her Majesty's Secret Service doesn't have like. There's no words, but the song itself that plays when uh, when the titles scroll. It's so good. It's amazing. It's okay. like for me, 
it's it's even better than the the original Bond theme for just how epic it is. It's so good, um, and yeah. uh, I'll be stealing it for my D and D sessions for later. Uh, <laughs> as far as 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 far as song song, uh, it has to be Adele Skyfall. Her performance, the nice. visuals, okay. how awesome. it fits, how it fits the the actual movie, um, just. The f- I mean, like it won an Oscar for a reason, you know. I I think mm. I think it's um it's a banger of a of a of a song first of all, um. But in addition, it sells to you what it means to be Bond at this very moment in this third film and how bad things are are uh, are going. But then you know it has this it has this hope in it, you know, like um. Because we'll we'll face it all together, right? Like she says in the song, and I'm like, oh yeah, man, I'm with you, Bond. I mean, I'm not really with you, Bond, but I'm I'm like here yeah, with you. I mean, yeah, you know, I'm in in my heart. I'm with you, man. Let's go. Let's uh, let's do this. It's amazing. Yeah, as far as the Daniel Craig movies, they're either like really hit or really miss. Like I hated the one with like Jack White, where he's kind of like rapping or something. It was terrible. I forget even which the one that was for. Is that Quantum of Solace? It might have been Quantum of Solace, yeah, but it was because Dan- know, so Daniel Daniel Craig did five. three movies, right? Uh, Casino no, Royale. He did five. Five? Whoa. Five. 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 All right, Damn. so right. there is Casino Royale. There's Quantum of Solace. There's Skyfall. There's Spectre, Skyfall. and there's No Time to Spectre. Die. Spectre. No Time to Die. Well, right. I five think movies. I I think I did not watch the last two that you mentioned for sure. I I think Spectre. Spectre is good. No time to die. I also haven't watched. I was planning to watch it for this, but then uh, what's it? I ran by, out of time. I think by the time I book. think by the time I think the last Bond movie I watched was uh, Skyfall. It's by that time. Uh, I think I've grown out of Bond, to be quite honest. But that I I again I come back to to what I was saying before. I really do not think. Uh, I think like. The movies are what made Bond such a pop culture icon. Not just I, I, and it's not just the the character himself, but also like so many of the things that 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 were established in movie language just because of the Bond movies, like the the really out of the world gadgets. And this is actually one thing I wanted to ask uh, <laughs> Rob: Do any of the crazy gadgets make it into <laughs> make it into the book? Not, not to any memorable extent. There probably are some, but it's if so, it's very, very marginal uh, in the books. As I remember, like uh, Nikki was describing the the crazy gondola that turned into a hovercraft. Man, it was that was so crazy when I was watching that. Like for me, really, the 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 Bond movies, the 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 five that I watched was like kind of realistic. Not so realistic. What the fuck is happening, Moonraker? And then like go yeah. goes back down right. to to like yeah. the world is not enough. Where it's like okay, kind of realistic. And then Casino Royale is like, all right, this you know this might as well have been uh, like a real life story that happened. But you know, There's like yeah. I also I also remember uh, some some of Timothy Dalton's movies where missiles were coming out of his uh, cars and all that stuff. <laughs> I remember that. It's like yeah not uh, that's like nothing of that a uh, present at all in the books i don't think you know given mm-hmm. how given how uh low key the books actually are compared to the movie i think a better word to yes a better word to use to describe the books would be low key not down to a yeah yeah more realistic spy tech from like cold war era yeah world, and world world, and but and and uh it's like you don't you don't get any of the high tech computerized data that born access for instance in casino royale you know breaking into m's apartment and and all this other stuff and m mm. m M-M, Ju- judy dench as uh m what do you guys think <laughs> I think well, she played it pretty right. well. I, yeah. I think the the relation between Bond and his boss is one of the really best things in the books. Actually, that uh, there's this mutual respect, but also 
edginess and tension at the same time. Uh, very, very well done in the book. So, I, mean, I can't really describe it, but uh, Bond really, yeah. one of the things he cares about most is to uh, not let the boss down. No, that's true. And uh, which is, again, so different from <laughs> the movies because it, I, I would say, I would say the, I would say, uh, the Daniel Craig movies where Judy Dench was M had probably had like the closest uh, employer employee relationship of all the Bond movies I've seen. Uh, where you can you mean, you mean realistic? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean that it's it's more fleshed out. I would say because there is clearly some uh, rapport uh, between the two of them uh, compared to the earlier movies where they were not like. It's more like I give you some orders and there you go kind of thing. Uh, there is there is some there is some like mutual respect between M and 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 Daniel Craig, but at the same time, it's nothing like in the book in Casino Royale, for instance. Like, like, um, uh, is. Yeah, I mean it's a bit hard to describe, but but Bond definitely respects the the organization he represents a lot more than in in the in the movies. I think it's maybe a factor of the gender change, and with you know you have Judy Dench, I, I felt like she was kind of treating him like a son almost. It, you know, maybe the son she never had in in the movie, so it was, seemed like it was maternal. Maybe that's yeah, just I, me. It could be. I can't speak for I can't speak for all books, but if the Casino Royale book, uh, James Bond was governed by a woman, I think he he like wouldn't be able to handle it. That's you, probably you yeah. that's probably true. Uh, the book made a great uh, made a big deal about. Um, Bond not liking women it, well, uh, in his presence when he's on a mission. I, I, I think that says a lot more about Bond than it does about women in general, to be quite honest, because apparently uh, he finds them very distracting uh, in missions. So, you know, that's a Bond <laughs> thing. That's definitely him. But at the same time, it's like, it's like, I you know I'm actually gonna have to go with uh, Rob here because I felt Vesper to be a to be a interesting character. It's just too bad she wasn't given more of a role. I think hmm. she she yeah I mean I guess she was a she was a yeah, she she was a um what what what's what phrase should I use to describe her? She was like a. Uh, decoration for Bond to 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 do things inside in the book yeah yeah the women in the I mean the women characters the female characters that were his love interest seem like you know hey he lives on the edge of death all the time and he needs some stress relief you know so throw him a woman like yeah it, it definitely seemed like they were just there to like have him have some fun downtime you know in between death defying Near death experiences and you know the heat of battle and spycraft. So, yeah. That that said though, I thought the Vesper in uh, in uh, in Casino Royale the movie had had quite a bit of sassiness to her. I would say. <laughs> right, that's yeah, why she sure. had to die in the end. Right. That's right. Oh, spoiler alert. I mean, but... right, oh, I, well, Robert, around at Robert, this point. I, Robert, I, any thoughts on a theme song? I, you know, we never got your buy-in on that. If you have any, any interest. thoughts about what? Sorry, a theme your song. Your favorite theme, theme song. song your favorite theme song. Favorite theme song. song. Oh well, I wouldn't know really. I, I don't remember all that much about things like oh, that. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So you're in the XJ camp. Yeah. I mean, typically, if it's not a musical, and I don't really like musicals, if I start noticing the uh, soundtrack. On my first watch, mm. that's usually a bad sign for the show. <laughs> yeah. Tomato, mm. tomato. I get you. 
Yeah. I think well, my, my favourite yeah. of the movies was The Living Daylights with uh, Timothy Dalton. Really? I, I really liked that one. What, what about it did you like? In particular, what? I thought it was well balanced and and multifaceted and the uh the this mad american whitaker was a good was a good villain and so was the the guy who plays i've seen him in other films uh notably um oh what's it uh, a film of the fugitive with uh, harrison ford he plays a, a villain there as well what's his name uh, Yorgi Koskov in the movie. I don't know who the guy, guy, the actor is. But anyway, good villain, and um, I just generally liked it. It's, it's the only thing it's got in common with the short story, The Living Daylights, of that name, is this uh, cello lady cello player whom Bond is sent to uh, assassinate, and he doesn't do it. Uh, which I mentioned earlier, his refusal to do assassinations. That's in the story as well, but none of the rest of it is. Yeah. I think it's and something Dalton like Jerome, had, always... Jerome Krabbe or something like that is the name of that guy. I can't Pardon? Jerome Krabbe, I think is the name of the man. <laughs> oh. right. There's the name of the guy that played the uh, villain. In yeah. the Living yeah. Daylights, okay. Mm. Well, all right. Well, um, I think one last question from me, which is, which is everyone's favorite Bond movie? Well, I mean, it's the Living Daylights for that guy. <laughs> I, I, I got a <laughs> strong go. suspicion. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, what about you, Nikki and Anthony? Anthony, why did you go first? Uh, I need to think about this. I, yeah, I. I you might have to say he's Casino Royale. I might have to say that. I mean, just from sheer the update of the character and having him have a little more human foibles and you know, a little bit of a loose cannon. You know, I guess you know that just as just as modern me. If it was younger me, I might have I might have said Moonraker back when I was a kid, just because of the fascination of it. I think I share that with Nikki. It was like. Oh my God! What's happening? It's so over the top, and the technology and the science fiction of it all, uh, being like a science fiction and fantasy nerd first and foremost. But uh, you know, in terms of the modern day and my modern self, I think I would say Casino Royale. Mickey, uh, it's a it's a big fight. It's a big fight between uh, Casino Royale and uh, Moonraker. But Moonraker is kind of a, a joke answer, really. I mean, it's my favorite Bond movie because it's so crazy. It's not a Bond movie, really. Uh, it's like a bunch of other movies that the screenwriters thought were really fun to watch. And they, and they slapped Bond in it. Um, right, probably, but, they yeah, just, probably they were just trying to cash in on the Star Wars thing. On, yeah, on the <laughs> Star Wars thing, man, for sure. I mean, Act 3 is so not james bond it's funny like it's actually crazy and the fact that that was the first yeah. movie that both uh, anthony watched and my father watched it's it's kind of it's crazy um so yeah. so and there's no it, it there's yeah there's no coincidence that like austin uh the austin powers movie had <laughs> made fun of moonraker is probably the best one but just because it's so crazy and goofy and over the top but anyway I mean, it it ahead, it's sorry. insane. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, I actually really enjoyed on Her Majesty's Secret Service. I didn't think I was gonna enjoy it. I wasn't enjoying the start, but yeah, it's like I ended up really liking that one uh, on my on my rewatch. But yeah, uh, if I have to go for best movie movie, it's definitely Casino Royale. I don't think it's hands down. Yeah, uh, it's an actual movie. Not just a James Bond and Travaganza. It's it's a really really good movie, uh, and it borrows a lot from Batman Begins. I feel. Um, I mean, at the time, the idea of backstories being really woven into into film and it all being about the origin of the character was very popular, and um, they did a magnanimous job 
at creating the quote unquote origin story to who Bond is. That is true. Like the first hour of the film is about the backstory, which is completely absent from the book. That is true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think actually, we have to ask Robert what his favorite book is as well, because he's read, you know, right. all the books or at least a good portion of them. I mean, it's not just the movies for him. Be- it's the before books, so before maybe... he answers, before he answers, I know that JFK's top ten, one of the top ten books that JFK ever read, John F. Kennedy, was From Russia with Love. He really loved that book. Yeah. And one of the I, reasons why I would why... agree with JFK actually. Oh, um, yeah. I think that's probably the best one. Yeah. It when when he said that in one of the interviews, uh, the sales for that book went crazy. You know, just one word from the president, and everyone's buying from Russia with love. Mm. It was the last movie he ever saw uh, before yeah. he uh, he was assassinated. Mm. You were about to say something before, uh, Rob. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um... I think it's that was a good question because I hadn't uh, hadn't really thought about it until then. But yes, <clears throat> excuse me, yes, uh, from Russia with love, I reckon. What? Why? Yeah. Yep. It's actually <laughs> it's actually a bit of an exception in that it's not one. He he doesn't do his usual thing of start the start being better than the end. I think it's fairly evenly good all the way through. Mm. And it's got a very unusual ending because, <clears throat> excuse me, Bond uh, is uh, m- virtually almost killed at the end. Uh, the the book ends with him being uh, poisoned by Rosa Klebb, and you don't know until you pick up the next book at the newsstand that he's gonna he's gonna live or die. Oh, that's crazy! He doesn't get poisoned in the in the movie version. She tries to poison him, but the 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 other Russian spy girl uh, saves him from from that fate. Right. Oh, and whenever okay. I asked my mother who was her favorite Bond girl, was like they are all interchangeable. <laughs> She's like they're all eye candy, so there isn't a favorite one. Mm. Uh, but she she definitely prefers the looks of Sean Connery, but she thinks that the uh, the actor who fits best the role is Daniel Craig, in her opinion, brutal mm. ruthless spy. <laughs> Which is uh, my assessment as well, yeah. yeah and yeah, yeah. I agree with uh, Nikki. Casino Royale is for me the best Bond movie. Um, but Sean Connery is the best Bond for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You gotta watch the the, the other uh, Sean Connery movies. I, I enjoyed that. Um, I think uh, actually that is one thing I, w- I will I will want to add. Uh, out of all the five films, uh, three of them made me want to see uh, like more with those actors, and that was from Russia with Love on Her Majesty's Secret Service and Casino Royale, and Moonraker made me n- never want to watch another James Bond movie again because they're not going to be as crazy as Moonraker. I'm just going to be disappointed. Uh, and the world is not enough. Is surprisingly was just enough. To get of Pierce Br- Bronson, that was enough for me. I didn't need to say any more. Hmm. Yeah, she yeah. had the one woman, the one, the one Bond girl, or she was a villain. She had the most ridiculous name. Like it was the real, like faux Russian name. It was like on a top, right? Like it was on a top, was it on like, a? T- yeah, it was yeah, like, like in that. the movie, like the one oh, character God, in the one yeah. Pierce Bronson movie. She was like Xenia on a top. And I'm like, oh my god, are you kidding All me? of the f- damn like even- names of these Bond girls just make me like, there's one that she's called Christmas, and at the end of the movie, right. that, I think that is, I think that is in the fucking, uh, the, mm. the world is not enough. Uh, where, Good grief. You know, Vesperlin, Vesperlin sounds positively normal compared to the order. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so yeah. Uh, at the end of the movie that they're having intercourse. And James Bond says, like, oh, I thought Christmas only comes once a year. <laughs> and you're like, oh, my God. Ah, give me back Moonraker yeah, with space I, lasers. I, I think those characters were in the same movie. It's like Christmas and On a Top. Like, yeah, oh, man. Like so I, I can ridiculous. believe it. I don't remember On a Top. I, maybe my mind just blocked it out because it was so ridiculous. Yeah, she was the girl. She was The actress was the one that played Jean Grey in the X-Men movies. I forget her name at the moment, but... 
Oh, okay. Yeah, Fam- F- Famke Jansen. Famke Jansen was uh, Xenia on a top <laughs> in that same movie with the the Christmas character, right? Yeah, she was the one that tried to crush Bond's head with her thighs. <laughs> and now yeah. way to die. <laughs> Talk- yeah, right. Talking of right. uh, talking of romance, uh, there's an interesting real life echo in the ridiculous film of Moonraker where Jaws uh, uh, has this romance with this tiny, tiny girl. Uh, in real life, Richard Keel, who play, played Jaws, who's seven foot two, uh, in real life was married to a, a girl who was five foot two. So that must have been quite a, quite a sight, you know, at the altar. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. All right, I guess uh, we have come to the end of this particular podcast. I have to say, I've been really enjoying the discussion on on Bond, I have to say. Uh, I don't know if we want to give a rating for what. It doesn't really mean anything, does it? The normal ratings, they don't really apply to... Yeah, they don't really apply in this uh, particular context, so... I guess we'll skip that. And with that... I mean, I just want to say Moonraker is 10 out of 10. Whatever scale we're, we're on, it's just 10 out of 10. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely mind-blowing. Mm. The Some, somebody somebody yeah. smoked something when they wrote the script for right. and, Moonraker. And plenty of it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I guess with that, uh, unless any one of you have anything else you want to add, no. no. Well, yeah, okay. Great discussion. Great discussion. Okay. Yeah, it was a great discussion. I hope uh, people enjoy listening to it as well. Like and subscribe and all of that. And with that, take care and goodbye. Thanks for watching. <laughs>